Light microscopes require lenses in order to produce magnified images and capture details within samples. Now, the tremendous improvement in the capabilities of microscopes over the last 300 plus years is a result of detailed knowledge of light, of lens material, and of how those two interact to produce high quality images. So in order to understand what's inside of a microscope and to understand how to use a microscope to the best of its abilities and to figure out how to innovate to produce new imaging capabilities, one needs to know the fundamentals of light, lenses, and image formation. So this lecture will talk about uh, four main topics. Um, I'll start with the properties of light, um, what they are, uh, how they are involved in uh, uh, moving through an optical system. Uh, next, I'll talk about light-matter interactions, uh, the very simple and basic concepts of reflection and refraction. And then we'll focus on refractive lenses. Uh, and those are the kinds of lenses that most light microscopes use to guide light, uh, direct it, and um, use it to form images. And finally, we'll talk about the details of image formation and uh, some of the things to watch out for, as well as some of the possibilities with those. OK, so let's start with uh, the big picture. And that is the electromagnetic spectrum. The light that we see, the light that's coming into our eyes, is the result of electromagnetic waves, um, uh, only a small bit of which we can detect. And that is the visible spectrum, uh, the visible spectrum here. Now, each of those wavelengths has a number of different properties. Uh, and you can think about a light wave uh, as being a sinusoidal uh, entity. But that sinusoid is not something that is physically oscillating up and down. Rather, when light is described as a wave or is uh, indicated as this sinusoidal pattern, what that's referring to is the electric field intensity. So along a given position, there's an electric field intensity that varies in space and in time. And it's a harmonic wave. And so there are a number of different properties that each wave has. It has wavelength, denoted by lambda. Uh, it has an amplitude, and that amplitude is the magnitude of the electric field, or uh, could be the, the, the magnitude of the magnetic field. And it has a frequency of oscillation, so how fast over time is it moving. And it also has a translation speed. So this is a moving uh, electromagnetic wave, propagating wave. And so that wave has a speed. It also has a phase. Uh, so it has uh, its peaks and troughs of the wave relative to some reference point um, uh, uh, move through 0 to uh, 360 degrees. It also has polarization, so an orientation to that electric field that's oscillating. Uh, some of these properties of waves are interrelated. So for example, speed is the product of the wavelength and the frequency. Those are, those are connected by the, the speed of light. So let's give a practical example. Most people have had to work with laser pointers before. So let's take a typical laser pointer that has a wavelength of about 635 nanometers. Um, and you can read on most laser pointers what is their power. Um, and let's take one that has 2 milliwatts of power. If you measure the area of the beam coming out, uh, that's one more property of this laser pointer. And then let's take something that other people have measured, and that is the speed of light. So if we take those four pieces of data, we can work out a few different properties of the waves that are coming out of our laser, uh, laser pointer. For one, we can calculate uh, the intensity of the wave. If we take the power that's coming out and divide it by the area, we get the intensity. That's a common measure of light passing through any imaging system, is how much uh, power per unit area or intensity is present. And for a laser pointer, that's a, a relatively large 250 watts per meter squared. Amplitude, um, so amplitude of the electric field. What is that field locally at, uh, the, uh, along the beam of laser coming out of the laser pointer? Um, and that, uh, if you calculate that, that's uh, proportional to the square root of the intensity. And that ends up being 430 volts per meters. And then we can calculate the frequency. If we know that this is a laser propagating in air, we can take the speed of light in air and divide that by the wavelength and get a frequency in uh, 1 over seconds, or hertz. Um, and that ends up being a very, uh, very large number. Um, so that's frequency, intensity, amplitude. Now what happens uh, when that light uh, interfaces with another material? 
So the speed of light in vacuum is a, a fixed and well-known number. And as soon as you pass light through other materials, uh, it turns out that light slows down. Um, and light slows down uh, in proportion to a number that is now known as the index of refraction. So if you measure a speed of light in a material, if you compare that to the speed of light in vacuum, the ratio of those two is this index. And so index of refraction has been quantified for a wide range of materials. And it's one of the most important properties of lenses that are used in imaging systems. And what you'll notice from, from the diagram here is that uh, the amplitude um, has remained quite large in this particular material. Uh, but the distance between the peaks and troughs have reduced. Uh, and what that means is that the wave speed is slowing down. It also means that the wavelength is getting smaller uh, as it passes through this higher index material. And then that wavelength is recovered and the speed is recovered as it exits the material. And so uh, what this tells us is that the properties of light uh, change as you move from one material to another. So you have to know what material you are in in order to be able to define well the properties of light. Okay, uh, when we make uh, drawings of light or when we talk about it, uh, um, oftentimes we don't use the wave representation, even though that's the more accurate way to think about light as being this, uh, this propagating wave. Oftentimes it's more convenient to simply denote it as an arrow or sometimes to indicate wave fronts. And so wave fronts would be positions of constant phase. Now, uh, the reason why this is convenient is the drawing is easier. Uh, but it also makes sense because the frequencies are extraordinarily high. Um, as we calculated for a laser pointer, uh, uh, frequencies on the scale of 10 to the 14 hertz is much faster than we see much faster than most detectors. So what uh, is most relevant is typically the intensity of light um, and the wavelength uh, material that it's in. So typically that can be uh, related simply by, by arrows. So there are multiple ways of referring to light passing through materials, and we'll take advantage of several of them. So let's move now to light-matter interaction, and uh, specifically what happens at interfaces. Now you've already learned that light slows down when it enters a higher index material, but what happens to the angle of the light if that light enters the material with an angle. So here, uh, what is being shown here is an incident wave. The incident wave is making contact with a higher index material. So the material below is, uh, has a slower wave speed. And two things will happen. One, it's observed, and you can see this uh, when you look at uh, a window uh, that has light shining on it, that uh, you'll get a reflection. And so that uh, reflection is uh, something that uh, occurs um, from uh, the surface of this uh, material. But you also get light that's propagating through the material. And so this, uh, m this light that's propagating through, transmitted through, is called a refracted wave. And you'll, you might notice that there's a, a kink in the incident wave to refracted wave. And that's because the angle at which that wave propagates through the material uh, has been found to depend both on the uh, angle of incidence as well as the index or refraction of the, of the two materials. Now we can uh, draw this as a series of rays, but we can also uh, denote this as a series of wave fronts. So if we think about uh, waves, uh, constant wave fronts coming in, um, this is the, another way to designate how this interaction is taking place. So th the relationships that have been observed have been formalized into laws. So law of reflection and law of refraction. And the law of reflection simply says, for a given material, given interface, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of, refraction, of, of reflection. Uh, uh, conversely, for the uh, refraction, uh, it depends on the index of material. So where light will go depends on the angle of incidence, uh, 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 the sign of that, times the index of refraction, will equal the, the same product in the transmitted medium. Now, th that, uh, these equations tell you something very useful and very important about light. They tell you where it's going to go at any interface. And these interfaces are assumed to be smooth uh, and specularly reflecting. Um, so that's, that's a caveat on this set of equations. But the important uh, point here is that this tells us where the light's going to go. But it doesn't tell us how much. So that's a, a second set of equations. 
how much light is passing through an interface uh, depends on, on a more extensive derivation, a set of equations uh, called the Fresnel uh, uh, reflection coefficients and transmission coefficients. But for the simplest possible case of light hitting a material normal, so uh, at a, a right angle to the surface, you can make a quick estimate for how much uh, of the uh, intensity is going to be reflected and how much of that intensity is going to be transmitted through the material. And if we take an example of, of glass, at an air-glass interface, uh, given an index of refraction of 1 for air and 1.5 for glass, about 4% of light is going to be bouncing back from that surface. Um, and, and the rest will be transmitted, assuming that there's, uh, that there's no uh, absorption. So we're going to uh, take uh, a moment and do a quick demo about how this uh, uh, manifests itself for a couple different materials using a light source and a detector to measure how much intensity is passing through them. So with this demo, what I want to do is introduce some concepts about light-matter interaction, and specifically the effect of wavelength. So we'll start with, with a nice uh, clear piece of quartz. It may even be hard to see, but there's a, a real piece of quartz right here. And what I've got are a light source. So this is a halogen lamp. And I've got a little detector. So this, uh, this thing right here is a detector that uh, measures how much intensity is uh, is is present on the face of this detector, and we can read it out with this uh, this dial here. So if you see that little red thing moving back and forth, that tells us how much light is hitting the detector. Uh, now, this is transparent, so it means at least to our eye, light can pass through it, and we might expect if I put this in the path uh, that my detector would not go down too much. So if I move in the path and move out, move in, move out. When I'm in, you see a slight reduction, and that's because there are, is reflection from both surfaces of the, of the quartz, but most of the light is getting through. OK, so let's contrast this with this thing here. So maybe you can see this a little easier. It's highly reflective. It's a piece of silicon. And if I put my eye up to it and I try and look, I see nothing through it. So I might expect when I put this in, in between the light source and the detector that I would extinguish all of the intensity, that I would, uh, that I would block all of the light. So let's, let's try that. So now it's in, and it's out, and it's in. I don't know if you can see, but the dial doesn't go all the way to zero it seems like there is still some intensity entering into the detector. Well, maybe that's just room lights. Uh, so let's add uh, a piece of metal. So this is just a metal ruler. And let's stick this also in the path of the detector. Now it goes to zero. So we didn't turn off the room lights. All I did was add one more thing blocking the path of the light. So why is that? Well, it turns out that silicon, while it's opaque to our eye, is not opaque to the lamp. And that's because the lamp, a halogen lamp, is producing infrared electromagnetic waves in addition to visible light. And that infrared, longer wavelength, lower energy, is, uh, can transmit through silicon. Uh, and as a result of the transmission, this, to infrared wavelength, uh, silicon appears like quartz does to our eye, uh, transparent. And in fact, if you build an infrared microscope, uh, some infrared microscopes use lenses made out of silicon. So now that we understand what happens when light interacts with an interface, we can begin to understand what happens at sets of surfaces, uh, more specifically at lenses, which have two surfaces. We can think about the bending of light at each surface independently. So each interface uh, will follow the same set of laws, the law of reflection and the law of, of uh, refraction. And that means that what we need to know in order to determine where the light will go as it, as it, as it hits a lens is to know where the normal is to that surface and to be able to work out from the law of refraction um, what angle uh, the transmitted light will make. 
And if we do that for both surfaces, we can figure out where light coming into uh, a, a chunk of material, like a lens, where it will end up. And if you design that material properly, then you can end up by controlling where those light waves go, where the rays go, and where they end up. And here's an example of a uh, simple positive lens in which uh, there's refraction at the two surfaces. And if you have an entire beam passing into this lens, uh, a, a beam like from a laser pointer, uh, all of those rays which are entering parallel will converge to a single spot. And that's called the focal point. And that focal point resides on a plane called the focal plane that is a distance uh, f or one focal length away from uh, the, the lens. Now, this is the, the, the proper way to think about light passing through a lens. Uh, but for people who want to uh, prototype optical systems or get a quick estimate for how a system is working, oftentimes we use simpler equations. And a simple equation is shown here at the bottom. That's the lens maker's equation. And that lens maker's equation uh, has two important simplifications. Number one, it assumes that the distance between the two surfaces of the lens are very small, so small as to be negligible. So we don't actually need to uh, follow the light as it moves between one surface or another. The second important simplification it makes is that the surfaces can all be described by spheres. That is, they can all be described by a single number or radius of curvature. So once you know the radius of curvature of the two surfaces of your lens, and you know the index of the lens, that's the n in the equation, you can calculate how far away parallel rays entering this lens will converge. And that's the focal length. And this is a very powerful equation because it gives us a very simple way of determining or designing what a lens should do and putting together simple systems. And as we'll talk about in a moment, there are a number of caveats uh, for this uh, simple equation, uh, things that aren't captured. Uh, but for the purposes of designing systems and uh, understanding how images are formed, this simple set of equations are very useful. Uh, now, uh, lenses come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, the, the one I showed you just before was a, called a plano convex uh, lens, and the plano is because of one surface being a, a flat surface or a radius of curvature that's infinite, uh, and the second surface having a uh, concave uh, curvature, a planar convex, rather, convex curvature. And if you take, if you imagine two spheres that intersect, uh, those two spheres intersecting can intersect in various ways, and each of those intersections will give you a different kind of lens. So here are the, the range of different uh, lens shapes that can be generated simply by intersecting two spheres. And if you have the correct uh, sign notation for your radius of curvature, you can simply calculate uh, what should that, uh, where should the lens focus. And one uh, interesting thing we'll get to at the very end is that the focal length doesn't always have to be a positive number. It can sometimes be a negative number. And when you have a, a negative focal length or a, a negative lens, uh, uh, the place where your image shows up uh, is different, and the kind of image you get is different as well. But let's go back to the simple case of a thin lens focusing a bundle of rays down to a point. So the way I've drawn this here is very much a point. It's, it seems to be infinitely small. But it's worth remembering that waves are not uh, infinitely small. They have uh, dimensions to them. They have wavelengths. And if you were to zoom in on that focal point, what does it really look like? Does it really look like a point? And the answer is no. This has been well known for a number of years. If you solve the full vector diffraction theories, uh, then you get uh, a distribution of intensity that looks like this, looks rather complicated. But there's a very important line that's drawn right here in the middle. And if you look at the intensity profile along that line, that's the so-called airy disk, which defines the point spread function of your system. Now, uh, this is a topic that will be covered in, in much greater depth in a, in a different lecture. But uh, this is uh, simply a reminder that our simplifications are useful for understanding uh, how systems are set up. But the details of resolution and of image quality often come down to uh, diffraction level effects, such as those shown here. A couple other things that can affect, most often negatively, your imaging capabilities. 
uh, are aberrations. And there are two main flavors of aberrations. There are chromatic aberrations and monochromatic aberrations. Uh, so chromatic aberrations are because that, that n, that index of refraction that defines our material properties, that n actually happens to be a function of wavelength. Uh, there's not a single index for a material. The index of the material depends on what wavelength you're passing through it. So the index can be higher or lower uh, for two different wavelengths, and therefore they will focus to different points. And correcting this has been a, a major challenge and uh, one of the major advances in light microscopy over the last several decades. So uh, the second kind of aberration is uh, monochromatic aberrations. And monochromatic aberrations are those that occur even if you only have one wavelength passing through the material. And an example of, of one of the five major monochromatic aberrations is shown here. Uh, this is spherical aberration. And this comes from the fact that even though spherical surfaces are the easiest to make, uh, the sphere is not the perfect focusing shape. In fact, you need uh, different shapes, aspheric shapes, in order to perfectly focus a given wavelength to a spot. But for, uh, for large focal lengths, um, spheres tend to do a very good job, and spherical aberration is not as bad. And so again, uh, the concepts of thin lenses, where we only care about the index and the rate of curvature, those concepts are still useful in thinking about how imaging systems work. Okay, so let's uh, build up our skills so that we can actually uh, uh, identify where uh, the image of an object will show up on one side of a lens. So we're going to learn three tools of the trade. And those are ways of identifying where rays should go, where these uh, representations of waves should go, uh, from a given point on an object. So if you think about an object as being something that is uh, scattering light or emitting light, uh, we have the option of picking a number of different rays coming from that and asking where do those go. So what we're going to do is we're going to be smart about picking rays that do things we know. And uh, the first is that any ray that comes in parallel to the optical axis, the optical axis is this uh, line all the way along the center of uh, the, the imaging system, that optical axis, uh, if the ray comes in parallel to it, the ray should converge through a positive lens through the focal point. Um, or if the ray comes in at an angle, it will still converge through the focal plane, uh, but offset from the, from the optical axis. So that's one very helpful rule. Parallel rays coming in go through the focus. The second helpful rule is just the opposite of that. Uh, if you have light coming from a focus, it will leave this lens as parallel rays. Uh, so, and you can imagine that those are the case because you could run the, these two diagrams. If you flip them around, they're the same. So there's one last uh, rule of thumb for ray tracing, and that is rays that pass through the center of the lens are not, uh, are not refracted. So in reality, they are refracted a little bit, but the refraction is opposite. So you bend it one way, and then you bend it back the other way. So it comes out looking as if it hasn't been refracted at all. So those three things, rays coming in parallel pass through a focus, rays coming from a focus come out parallel, and any ray that passes through the middle of the lens isn't bent at all. So we can now use that uh, to figure out where should an image show up uh, if we have a lens in front of this object. So we'll start by tracing um, a few rays. So these rays are all coming from the tip of the object. So let's take this, uh, the middle ray. So there's, the middle ray is passing all the way through the center of the lens. And based on that rule number three, we shouldn't bend it at all. Uh, that ray should pass all the way through and uh, continue going. Now if you look at the bottom ray, that bottom ray is, is coming from the tip of our object. But we've chosen it so that it passes through the focal point of our lens, so the front focal point of the lens. And what that means is that when it hits the lens, we know it must be coming out parallel to the optical axis. So the optical axis is, again, this, this, uh, this, this, dotted, line, uh, this dotted line here. So where those two rays converge, that is where the tip of our image must be. The rays that came from that tip the lens is converging them back to that tip, and that's what uh, allows us to do, uh, to do the imaging. 
And that third ray is one that doesn't follow either of our rules, uh, but we know that any, now any light coming from that tip must end up at its conjugate point uh, on this other tip. So these two planes, the object plane and the image plane, are known as conjugate planes. And the points within them that from which light comes and to which light goes are conjugate points. Now, we can take other points on that same object and make the same sets of arguments, that rays passing through the middle of the lens don't bend, rays that pass through the focus come out parallel, and we can identify the other part, the other end of this object, as well as each point uh, in between. Now, this, uh, we've used drawing, essentially, to figure out where things ought to go. But this drawing is a shortcut for some relatively simple math, uh, which uh, can also be used to calculate where uh, an object and image uh, are. So there are two, two equations uh, that are worth remembering. One is the thin lens equation, which relates the distances uh, from the object to the lens, and that's denoted SO, uh, and the distance from the lens to the image, that's denoted SI. And that's, those two uh, quantities are related to F, the focal length, by this thin lens equation. So that will tell you where, uh, for a single positive thin lens or for a negative lens, where does the image show up. The second equation is magnification. Oftentimes, especially in microscopy, we want to know how big something is, or we want to make it uh, a certain size. We want to increase its, its size so we can see detail. Uh, the magnification uh, uh, is, by definition, the transverse magnification, is uh, the ratio of the heights of the object and image. And those, it turns out, are related to the distances uh, of the object to the lens and the image to the lens. Now, I'll point out one other thing, and that is when uh, the object is in place, the focal length uh, is, so we don't, we're not placing the, the object on the focal plane. So when we say something is in focus, uh, we don't necessarily or we don't always mean that the object is in the focal plane. We simply mean that we are getting an image which is, uh, in, which, which is good quality. So uh, focus, that, that distance f, isn't the place where you always put the object. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a case in which you can put an object there, but then you need another lens in order to form the image. So we'll uh, take a, uh, do another quick demonstration about how to think about lenses forming images, and a couple of examples. For this demonstration, we'll look at the properties of positive lenses and their ability to form images. So I've got uh, four things here. One is the same light source I used before. It's connected by a fiber optic cable to uh, a collimator. And a collimator is simply uh, a single lens that takes the, the light that is emanating from this fiber and creates a parallel collimated ray. So much like the diagrams in which rays that are passing parallel will be converged to a focal point by a positive lens. So we can test that out simply by taking a lens, these are two lenses, uh, take one of them and we move it in the path of the light. And what we would expect to see is at some position past the, the lens, there should be the spot of tightest focus. And we can, uh, we can identify that using a simple piece of paper and uh, moving that from the lens position uh, until we see the tightest uh, spot. And now we see it expanding again and tight and expanding again. And this is often uh, a simple way of figuring out what lens you have. If you have a lens in a drawer and you want to know what is its focal length, being able to take a light source, even an overhead light, and uh, position it such that that overhead light is in focus, uh, or finding the minimum spot, and then taking a ruler and measuring what that is, you can get a, an estimate of, of the focal length of, of the lens. Now, just converging the rays to a focus is a good start, but really we want to converge rays to a focus from an object of interest, so from a sample. So let's add one more thing to this system, and that is a, a tiny little cross. So this is uh, an opaque surface uh, of glass that has a small, thin uh, cross that allows light through. And if we put this 
object at the focus of the lens. Uh, it's being illuminated by this light, but it's now at the focus of one lens. Those parallel rays that are coming from different, different spots on that cross are coming through this lens. And if we look at where the light is, We can see initially there's a nice sphere, or a nice circle, rather, of intensity. And that circle of intensity is going smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then right where we found the smallest uh, circle of light uh, from the focus of the lens, we see the image of that cross. Now the image of the cross, if you go above it, it blurs out. If you go below it, it blurs out. And it's interesting to note how uniformly illuminated this is. You wouldn't know if you looked at that intensity that this is a, a, a cross or rays from a cross. It's only at the position of uh, best focus where you see the cross. Now, we also know that you can put lenses together and uh, uh, increase the magnification or change the location of, uh, of images. So what if we add a second lens to that, that system? So we've taken an object, we've created an image. If we add another lens, we should be able to use this as the object and create an image. So if we look on the wall, and if we adjust the position of this lens, we've now uh, created uh, an imaging system where I have uh, uh, a two lens system. I've taken one step to uh, change the, the size of my cross. This is uh, actually demagnifying a little bit. And this is magnifying. So the size of this cross is substantially smaller than that one. And based on our lens maker's equation, we should be able to uh, determine, based on the focal length of the lens, the separation between the object and the image, we should be able to, to, to calculate that. And similarly, we should be able to get the magnification out of those by the ratio of the distances. OK, so hopefully now you believe that when you have a single lens, you're able to uh, control the angles at which light is propagating, and you're able to form an image uh, from an object. Now let's take a few harder cases. So ones in which we move an object into places that don't create a real image. So we call images where the light actually converges and creates an intensity pattern, we call that a real image. And those are the kinds of images that we put onto CMOS cameras. Those are the kinds of things that we record uh, because we want to be able to know what that intensity distribution is. And real images are required for that. But in some situations, for example, in eyepieces, uh, we want to create virtual images. And the, an example of creating a virtual image is shown in the lower figure. And the way you can accomplish this with a positive lens is to move the object inside of the focal distance. So for your SO to be smaller than your focal distance. And what that means is that the, the actual rays coming from this object are going to diverge uh, coming out of the lens. But if you trace those rays back, the, 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 the object or the image that they appear to be coming from, if we didn't have the lens there at all, it appears that the, the light is coming from a virtual image. So that's the concept of a virtual image. You, your object is real, uh, but you're creating a virtual image that someone looking at this uh, didn't know that there was a lens there. They would think it's coming from that virtual image. So the same can be done with negative lenses. Uh, you have an object and you create a uh, virtual uh, image because the negative lens, uh, wherever you place the object, is going to diverge the rays. And again, tracing those rays back, where they appear to come from is the virtual image. Uh, and you can uh, uh, conversely use a negative lens to take uh, rays that are converging and move the position of image formation so that it creates a virtual object. That's shown in the, in the lower, uh, lower picture. So with a basic understanding of uh, waves, of rays, and how they move uh, through surfaces, uh, 
and how you can shape surfaces in such a way as to control where the rays go, you can start to assemble combinations of lenses so that defined curvatures of multiple lenses can be used to take light from an object and reform it into an image through a set of lenses that uh, eventually, when you add all of the special features that we need for microscopy, become the modern research microscope. And that's the objective here, is to introduce you to the, the very fundamentals of light and image formation so that you can begin to understand what exactly is the microscope doing. So just to review, uh, we talked about the properties of light, um, uh, its wave nature, and the, 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 the different properties that allow it uh, allow us to, uh, uh, to work with it and for it to generate contrast and samples. We uh, talked about light-matter interaction, um, refraction and reflection most importantly, and how uh, with refractive lenses you can control the curvature, the shape of these lenses, and define where an object and an image uh, will be. And finally, uh, this image formation uh, can be achieved by uh, controlling uh, those positions and assembling sets of lenses uh, that give the desired magnification with the desired resolution. So that's our first step towards understanding what's inside.